The purpose of the uh, platform session is to have some careful, focused discussion, to uh, exchange uh, ideas among the panelists and then with you, uh, the audience, and to generate some programs for future research. So with that in mind, I give you Professor Balakandara. Let me begin by protesting with Ravindra. He is discriminating against me. You saw it. They all got gifts. Yeah? Well, anyway, doesn't matter. There is a price for being, a, being an organizer, I suppose. Yeah, good. Second problem is I don't even have a badge. So people, if you haven't got your kits yet, don't worry. As Ravindra said, wait. As uh, I think it was Milton who said, they also serve who only stand and wait. So just wait, your turn will come. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not going to speak for long, about three to five minutes which basically means 15 minutes, of course, but <laughs> anyway. Uh, I won't reproduce my paper. I'm very, very briefly going to summarize it because I want the specialists to respond to some of the thoughts I have penned, up, penned in the paper. Uh, I am not a specialist in law. I'm not even a layman in law. But I've done some serious reading the last two years in law, especially in criminal law and jurisprudence of criminal law. You will see it reflected in the paper. But I believe what I have to say could be of some significance to comparative law. So these four specialists will respond and we'll see what my ideas are worth. The first point is, of course, about the format of the India platform sessions. We have been changing it every year. Uh, in order to arrive at an optimum. Naomi, as usual, is wonderfully optimistic. She says, we have reached perfection. <laughs> I'm already thinking about the next format, how, what we should be doing. <laughs> Differently. <laughs> so, uh, let's hope we've reached perfection, who knows. Uh, today's theme is about the notion of truth and falsity in law. When I say in law, what I mean by that is, of course, the institutions, the Western institutions, legal institutions. Now, I have discovered through my study of criminal law basically that the notion of falsity, falsehood, as it is used in law basically, has two core components to it. One of the more prominent, the other less so. The less prominent one is, of course, related to the character of the speech, that is, the language we use. We can describe something the way it is, or we can describe something the way it is not. And describing it not the way it is, to say what the thing is not, is falsehood. And to say how the thing is, is to tell the truth. This is actually the minor idea, the minor component of the meaning of truth in Western law, and the core component has to do with the idea of deception. So lying involves, in fundamentally, especially deriving from the Latin word of falsum, implies the notion of deceiving, deception. Now the Western institutions of law depend very, very s strongly on this core component. Not that there are, could not be lies without deception, but the meaning, the basic meaning is this. In contrast, in India, in Indian culture, in multiple languages I know, in multiple areas in, that I have visited, we make a distinction between lie and deception in a very, very sharp way. Lies could also involve deception. We, in fact, even have a separate word in Sanskrit for it. I've forgotten it. I'm sure some Sanskrit pundit can eliminate me about it. But basically, lies and deception are separated from each other to such an extent that telling the truth could be immoral, where telling a lie could be a moral thing. We have any number of stories which illustrate this standpoint. So to us, telling lies is not an issue at all. Doesn't mean therefore all Indians are liars. I'm not making such stupid claims. But I'm pointing out a fundamental semantic distinction because of which 
attitude. For example, the British confronted continuously the problem of perjury or telling lies in truth under oath. As I say in my paper, one of the basic reasons why they introduced the English education in India was, to, was in the hope that they would teach the Indians the virtues of telling truth and not commit perjury. Now, the more general question I want to ask is this. When we bring, and this of course, this notion of truth and falsity, non-trivially, in a very important sense, depend upon the presence of some kind of Christian anthropology, which is also some kind of Jewish anthropology. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, <laughs> she would not like to be called a Jew in any sense. That's why I'm, I kind of looked at her. So, uh, if this anthropology and this idea is not dominantly present, is not prominently present, is not part of a culture, there these institutions, I suggest, have a tendency to be deformed in a very, very fundamental sense. And that, according to me, enables us, and that we shall see in the next two days, to understand the kind of massive corruption in the judiciary, the possibility of massive corruption, of course. It doesn't cause the corruptions. Corruption makes it possible. One of the puzzles that has uh, kept many jurists and, and people awake. Why is Indian judiciary after independence, not just judiciary, but definitely the judiciary also, so massively, so almost completely got corrupted after independence, which is not even 75 years ago. So my, in my uh, proposal or in my story, I tried to show that this is one of the reasons which allows us to understand the possibility of this massive corruption. In other words, what happens, to put it a bit bluntly, what happens when concepts or words and with, with their associated meanings, in this, in this sense concepts, as a part of a much more coherent story about law, migrate from a culture where it has grown, where it was fed, where it was nurtured, where it was sustained, to another milieu where such sustenance is not possible. What happens to such things and how then do we start conceptualizing comparative law in today's world? Naomi, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I invite the panel for comments on Professor Balgangadar's <coughs> talk right now or the, uh, the paper. Anyone? Comments? Just on this. On this particular Okay. Professor uh, Mensky. Right. Let me first of all thank the organizers, and I thank you and uh, Marianne probably for, for getting us here. And let me say it on behalf of all of us so we don't have to say it five <laughs> times. Yeah? Um, this is a, a totally impossible task to respond to your paper, I feel, because you've put us uh, on the spot in terms of truth and falsity, but now you're talking here about deception, massive corruptions, all sorts of other things. So there are many big, big issues here that you're raising, and I'm grateful to you for doing that. But you're torturing us, and it's good. Yeah? So uh, if I may just comment on what you just said, I think what you just said refers more to the third day of what we need to do, and the end of the conference rather than today. I think today we ought to focus, first of all, on getting our facts right about truth and falsity. Because I feel, I mean, I've spent 35 years doing these things, but I feel that we're going around in circles and we're not getting very far, as you do, it seems, um, if we are not talking to each other uh, basically in the same language. And you have identified in the morning in your address very clearly. And I agree with you that this process of rethinking is necessary at this historical time um, because this looking at India through a Western whatever perspective has become so dominant that the other perspective, if there is any other perspective, we'll see. Uh, has become overshadowed totally and sort of 
buried under all sorts of debris or what have you. Um, and when you talk about deception here, you thought about truth and falsity. I'm thinking much more about scholarly methodology and what we engage in as scholars when we theorize. Because I think we engage in deception by theorizing, because we pick a certain theory that we like, and certain facts that we agree with or want to focus on, and zoom in on those and make our own theory and our own construct, but forget the whole picture. And if you are addressing us or are expecting us to be specialists here, I'm in the wrong place. I don't think I'm a specialist. I would fake it if I said I'm a specialist, probably. I never studied English law. I studied Hindu law and Muslim law. I did Sanskrit and Hindi and all that, but I'm a generalist, probably, a sort of interdisciplinary person. Um, and so what I want to suggest here in response to your uh, starting point of deception is we ought to lay our books open and stop engaging in what I call now partial theorizing, partiality, which is another form of deception, and maybe engage in something like meta-theorizing, a bigger theory, getting the bigger picture. So if you want us to put religion and law together and ultimately talk about comparative law and methodologies of comparative law. I think we need the bigger picture. We need the whole picture. Robert? I, I think I'll stop there and I have okay, other I'll points, but I'll do it later. <coughs> so um, this is a, a general response to the, the paper, which I didn't read as being about law at all, but really much broader than that. It's, it's a, a discussion of what truth means, and even more than that, reminded me of a venerable tradition within historical anthropology, uh, a long discussion uh, that claims to describe um, a difference of mentalities or even an incommensurability of cultures. And this was the old debate that goes back to Lucien Levy Bruhl and others, where Levy Bruhl, for example, argues in such books as uh, Primitive Mentality uh, or How Natives Think that uh, natives do not observe the law of non-contradiction. Now, this is not exactly what you're saying, and, and of course, what I'm trying to do is to link the claim that Bala was making here, which is a very strong claim, I think, for the radical difference of cultures, to this older scholarly discourse, which, by the way, has largely been discarded. Why? Because it seemed to imply that there was a hierarchy or an evolutionary scale of cultures. Uh, so I can invoke also in this connection uh, Benjamin Lee Worf, especially because we were, we were talking about language, and as uh, Balu quite rightly noted, truth or falsity is a, prop is a uh, property of propositions or of natural language sentences. Uh, Benjamin Lee Worf points out, for example, um, one of the authors of the famous Sapir-Whorf hypothesis that um, in Hopi language, for example, there are no verb tenses. There's no such thing as a past tense. So what, for example, does this imply about the difference in thinking, the difference in mentality between uh, speakers of Hopi and speakers of what Worf called uh, standard average European? Um, quite possibly it implies something very great, an incommensurability of minds, uh, not necessarily an evolutionary difference. Now, it struck me also that um, as I was reading this, that if someone looking like me were to make such a claim as people in India don't observe the same distinction between truth and falsity, that I might very properly be taken to, to be uh, a colonialist. Um, obviously, that's not what's implied here. I think there are arguments against and for what Balo has proposed, very, very serious historical arguments. Could, uh, I. I just think it could be useful if you said what you thought Ballou proposed in the paper so that everyone who hasn't read the paper would know that. Okay, uh, I, I assumed it was clear enough, but let me restate it, that within India there is not uh, natively a distinction between truth and falsity, at least not 
one that is maintained with the rigor with which it is maintained in Christian cultures, and that this has to do, do with, with the do difference between good that? and evil. Do you agree with that? No, I don't. But it's oh. okay. Let him say that. <laughs> okay. All right. Let him get, have a false proposition yeah, on the table? Yeah, let me have a false okay, proposition. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so so the, on, back to the question of the incommensurability of, of, of mentalities. I mean, you know, a, a similar claim has been made, for example, to use a different illustration, that the sense of time is different in India, that there has been, at least historically, let's not talk about now, but in the Sanskrit texts that, that I had read before, an emphasis on cyclical as opposed to linear time. In the Judeo-Christian cultures, we have a notion of linearity. And this implies something radically different about uh, the mentalities of the two that, that don't quite meet up together. But it has to be very properly noted that um, nobody walks in circles. Everybody walks forward. Everybody uh, walks in a straight line. People get their business done. And moreover, people do know the distinction between true and falsehood, even if they convert it different ways in different cultural contexts. Because otherwise, there would be no functioning. There would be no deals. There would be no social trust. Uh, and as Maurice Bloch has pointed out, these kinds of fanciful notions of um, cyclical time and, and, uh, and such that we find are largely circumscribed in ritual or particular religious contexts. Uh, they don't necessarily carry over into day-to-day -day living. So in, in terms of the pragmatics of living, we all know how to use language. We, uh, we all know that it has a meaning and it can be true or false and so forth. But there's a sense in which I think there are some very powerful arguments in favor of what I understood Bala to be uh, saying, whether or not I was mistaken. Uh, in my interpretation of him. And that is, um, I think Christianity, but not just Christianity, I think it's much more specifically emerging out of the Baconian tradition, has insisted very strongly on the univocality of language. Language has to have a particular meaning, this and nothing else. So the search for a language in which one word meant one thing, and the term they used was eadam natura, eadam nomenclatura, one, one nature, one nomenclature. Uh, was used in bringing it back to law by someone like Jeremy Bentham within the Baconian tradition to insist, to insist that language has to be made absolutely transparent, absolutely clear, so that the concept of truth can be ri rigidly enforced, even within the concept of law. Now, this is not, again, bringing it back to law, because although I didn't think the first theme was written about law at all, there are some examples we can get from law that bear on this question. As many Western scholars have pointed out, if you look at the Dharma Shastras, if you look at the laws of Manu, there are many laws given which do not all agree with each other. So for example, in chapter five of Manu, you find laws about vegetarianism that say, you must be a vegetarian or you'll be punished in the afterlife. It's better to be a vegetarian, but it's okay if you're not. Um, you can eat meat as long as it's been consecrated and so forth. And they don't all agree with each other. And the question is, can you get a positive law out of that? Uh, you certainly can't, not in the sense of a Benthamite univocal positive law that would establish a rigorous standard of legal and also therefore epistemological truth. Um, and there are various reasons for this. I'm not sure that it's uh, entirely attributable to uh, a radical difference of cultures, but some people have pointed out, for example, that Manu was a um, post hoc codification of customary traditions which did not agree with each other. It was never meant to be uh, imposed as a kind of uh, absolute legal standard. And moreover, it reflected certain oral traditions, which is opposed to uh, written traditions, especially those associated with printing, with codification, which after all was what Bentham and uh, his brethren were all about, also in the colonial Indian context, is radically opposed to uh, those kinds of um, flexibilities of thought associated with orality. And, and so this is, uh, I would also invoke in this, uh, in this context the uh, Webb Keen's recent argument in Christian Moderns that Protestantism insisted on a certain kind of sincerity and transparency in the use of language as opposed to performative and poetic language, which we often find in such texts as the Dharma Shastras. So the, these, are, these are kinds of anthropological and historical data points that one could invoke to flesh out this quite abstract philosophical proposition that I took Bala to be expounding in theme one. Thank you. Is this mic on? First, let me say it's, a, it's really an honor for me to be here, uh, and I feel a little inadequate uh, being this panel. I have done a lot of work over the years on law and religion, but not so much on comparative law or comparative religion. I think there are certain similarities in some of what I do and 
some of the uh, themes that uh, Professor Balu has explained this morning. I tend to emphasize the importance of religious traditions. I would say not just Christian, but but Jewish interacting with Greek and Roman, all interacting with each other, but in, in shaping uh, Western uh, thought and institutions and law. And uh, I sometimes do try to emphasize the distortions, I think, that um, can be affected by the, by the attempt to ignore uh, some of that or to filter it out. Uh, I think uh, Balu talked about that this morning. Uh, but I haven't really done that, focused on that in a comparative sense. So uh, this is my first time in India and I can't claim to be any sort of expert on Indian law or Indian culture. Uh, I hope I'll uh, be able to learn more then, but I, I hope I'll be able to contribute something. Um, the, uh, the, the position paper for today talks a lot about truth and that's something, truth and falsity, lying and deception, and that's a theme I think that's running through all of the position paper uh, and so all of the subjects for today. And I thought I might just make two or three observations uh, about um, the remarks for today and the position paper for today. Um, first of all, um, an important distinction is, uh, that, that's suggested is that in Indian languages and culture, um, there is an important distinction between uh, lying and deception. Uh, I hope to hear a little more about that because I have to admit I'm not clear on what that would be. Uh, in uh, English speakers that I'm familiar with, speaking loosely, I think would often use lying and deception almost interchangeably. If they are trying to be a little more precise, I think they might say that lying is a subset of deception. Uh, there are certain contexts, I think, in which people might say that uh, Lying is impermissible, though deception is permissible, and court settings might be one such, uh, one such context in which people might say, uh, you know, you, you can't really perjure yourself, you can't lie, um, but it's all right as long as you don't lie to deceive. So there are certain contexts, I think, in which that might happen, but I'm not at all clear on what it would be to have an opposition to deception without having uh, an opposition to lying. So I hope to, uh, I hope to hear a little more about that. I also had some questions about the description of Western views about truth and falsity and some doubts about whether the contrast between Western and Indian culture could be as great uh, as I think the position paper suggests that they might be if I, if I read it correctly. So let me just say a couple points in that respect. Um, First of all, I think it's almost surely true that in the West, um, nearly everyone, most people I should say, thinks that some deception and some lying is occasionally permissible. And maybe uh, as uh, Professor uh, Balu says, Indian parents would do, Western parents might also instill some sense of that, that you know, you might tell some white lies occasionally to avoid causing offense. You know, there, there are other contexts in which for utilitarian or public spirited reasons, lying might be considered to be permissible. Uh, and I think there's been a widespread sense in the West that in certain, let's say, conditions of oppression, um, lying may be permissible because um, basically the people demanding statements of someone don't have a right to, to, to have the whole truth. So, so I'm not sure in that respect that there would be as large a contrast as uh, Bala's paper suggests that there would be. There might be more similarities. The other question that I would bring up uh, with respect to the description has to do with the role of Christianity in um, inculcating some sense, you know, strong commitment to truth telling um, and aversion to falsity. I mean, I, I think there's no doubt that Christian teaching does. Um, and so does Jewish teaching, thou shalt not bear false witness, you know, does emphasize the importance of truth telling. Um, but I don't know that uh, I could, uh, that I would think that that's primarily a Christian contribution to Western understandings. On the secular side, I think most of my secular friends would uh, almost take offense at the suggestion that their commitment to truth telling is really something that they owe to, to, to some sort of Christian heritage. Uh, and they might point to people like Socrates and others, you know, who also believed in truth telling, even if they didn't point to Jewish sources. And even on the Christian side, I think if, if in the thinking of people like Thomas Aquinas, you know, there's kind of a natural law, but there's some things that can be known through reason and are not specifically Christian. Um, and there are other things that 
are more specifically Christian and can only be known through revelation. So something like a belief in the Trinity is probably, you know, or uh, in taking the uh, Eucharist at the Mass and so forth, those are things that are specifically Christian and no one could be really expected to know those things except through revelation. But when it comes to truth telling, I, I think that the Christian view uh, would be that's something that applies universally and that people know through reason. They don't need to know that through any kind of specific revelation. And some of what Robert said I think would apply here because I think it would be fairly easy to argue and to argue quite persuasively that some kind of commitment to truth telling, to not lying, is inevitably going to be part of any kind of human enterprise uh, in which humans have to interact with each other. Um, we have to know if someone says I'm going to be at the conference you know, and I, I will show up, that they're going to do it. They mean that, that you know, they're, they're telling the truth. Um, and similarly, in any kind of personal way, it's hard for me to imagine that there would be a culture in which lying would not be seen as subversive of good friendship or of dishonoring good friendship, relations among parents and children, relations among friends. Um, uh, so I guess my view is that uh, this is an area that Christianity has emphasized. Christianity may have, spe have um, given special emphasis to it, you know, through years of homilies and sermons and catechisms and so forth. It's possible that Christianity has, you know, uh, underscored commitments to truth telling. It may also be true, uh, um, uh, a colleague of mine who's uh, Jewish and, you know, very learned in the Jewish tradition will often read my papers and say, that's very Christian because you seem to put a great deal of stock on true belief. He says, whereas Jews, and I don't know if all Jews would agree with Maimon on this point, but he says, you don't put as much you know, emphasis on having true belief. We put more emphasis on conduct and you know, community and things of that sort. Uh, it may be that Christianity has done that also. So, so, so I don't deny that there may be some distinctive Christian contributions to the Western ethic of truth telling. But I doubt that it, uh, I'm skeptical as to whether it has the really unique or distinctive or primary uh, role that uh, Professor Balu's paper suggests that it does. So, Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was very uh, on target and clear. Uh, I am, I am okay. uh, trust me, I'm very, uh, very grateful. Yeah. But I, I won't say uh, any, any more words relating to my gratefulness um, in view of what the others have said. Um, uh, I have made some notes on based on Balu's paper, so if you don't mind, I will sort of look at you, but I'll also read through, through them. I'll try to do both at the same time. Um, I should also emphasize, like others have said, that you know the, the, the level of specialism that uh, may be expected may not be met uh, in reality. Um, I started off my uh, academic life really as a scholar of uh, migration law. Um, and then increasingly I've taken an interest in questions of uh, cultural diversity and law and more latterly in uh, comparative law, particularly comparative law, law of non-Western countries um, between themselves and the comparative law of non-Western countries and Western law as well. But it, it's, it, it's at such a general level of abstraction that uh, I, I hesitate very much to call myself uh, a, a specialist. Um, now, um, I, I take note uh, of the fact that uh, the, the concern, uh, the central concern in uh, Balu's paper I here is really about the f uh, course of future research. So what, what are we as academics, what kind of agenda are we going to set for, for, the, for the forthcoming years? Um, in this context, I think uh, Balu's ideas do dovetail into our, our various concerns and concerns within the literature, uh, although they may, they may not have been expressed in that particular way. Um, one particular difference that we will no, no doubt return to um, in Balu's paper uh, is the question of the deep marking of Christianity or, on Western culture and law, which critical scholars uh, have by and large bypassed. Rather, critiques of Western law have tended to focus on modernity as either wiping out or at least curtailing the salience of pre-modern non-state forms of social and legal organization within legal theory and practice. Uh, or setting up a meta-narrative of law that is immune to consideration of particularities and difference. Um, so Balu's insights t take us uh, far deeper into the nature of Western law through a study of the Christian inheritance of Western culture. Um, from that point, uh, the explanation for the failure of legal transplants uh, in Balu's paper has something to do with the religious backdrop of the West and the deformation of Christian ideas in a non-Christian milieu. Here, 
uh, Balu keys into uh, and develops further the work of scholars who have focused on the f uh, what we call in the in the context of legal academia uh, the fate of legal transplants. Um, there are various schools of thought among them. Uh, these so-called the scholars who are interested in legal transplants. Some of them uh, say that transplants don't work because they have come from a different culture. Um, others say that uh, the culture argument is overstated. Uh, I tend to be one of the former group, uh, but it is helpful to understand that of major si significance here is the non-intelligibility of certain ideas and concepts because of their being tied into a religious culture. And th this is from Balu's paper. I suspect that Balu would say the same of certain Islamic concepts too, and possibly of the failure of legal transplants from the Christian into the Islamic worlds, which is something I've been preoccupied with recently. Um, while they share the Semitic culture of religion, uh, the differences among them cannot either be overlooked. So, uh, Balu's proposal will be one major step to working through the problem of inserting religious ideas and legal constructs into a culture uh, different from which they were developed. I want to fl uh, flag in particular the work of the late uh, uh, Japanese legal pluralist scholar uh, called Masaji Chiba, and I understand from Werner Mensky there are some, some books uh, out on the shelf, uh, on, on, on the display table uh, by Masaji Chiba, so very important scholar. Um, Masaji Chiba also strongly sensed the unworkability and even the distortion of legal transplants and tried to study them comparatively in Asian contexts. Um, he, he was primarily interested in the influence of Western legal constructs as they were coming into Asian legal systems. And so he was also looking at the fate of legal transplants in that different, different situation. Um, he noted clearly that legal transplants will fail because of a tendency uh, to prefer one law rather than another. And that such a preference is made on cultural grounds. This skepticism is also evident in Werner Mensky's work, for example, in his, uh, particularly in his book, The Comparative Law in a Glo Global Context, uh, which at present is, if I may say so, the best text to study non-Western legal systems in comparison to one another and in comparison to Western law. And in fact, I use it as a core text for my course. Um, I think Mensky too would say that there is a preference based on cultural grounds which conditions the working of a legal transplant. Balu's observation about the lack of questioning by students of culture of the relationship between law and culture is crucial. The severe lack of development of what, what one might call socio-legal studies in India is to be bemoaned, and it is hoped that a new interdisciplinary collaboration of sorts is given a further spur because of the initiative of this conference. It is instructive to note that when Chiba tried to accomplish a series of tests, among them, uh, to assess the fate of legal transplants in Asian, various Asian jurisdictions, he found the product of his collaborators often frustrating because they tended to view, view the legal orders which they had been tasks, tasked to, to talk about through the lens of Western legal theory and therefore could not produce an adequate account of the socio-legal reality of the jurisdictions with which, of, about which they were talking. Chiba's frustration is evident already in the book that he edited in 1986. In Balu's terms, we might speak about the persistence of colonial consciousness. So here, you know, one can tie in quite usefully uh, Balu's introduction of the term colonial con consciousness and how it blocks or prevents access to the experience of one's own legal, legal order or legal system. Um, specifically on truth and falsity now, um, it is worth noting how productive, again, the examination of the Christian backdrop of what is now natural language use in Europe can be in the assessment of core legal ideas or ideas that crucially inform law. The immediate image I had when looking at Balu's section uh, on this issue was the frequency with which the question of credibility comes up in certain legal contexts in British law. Um, this may of course be because of my skewed uh, exposure to studying law, but immigration cases stick out as one of the main sites where assessments of credibility of a person are most frequently made. And Balu's thesis bears out uh, because the assessments are used to characterize the quality of the applicants or those giving evidence, i.e., they link directly to, the, to personhood or the person as being untrustworthy. In fact, I've never come across the Home Office, the British Home Office, which you know, nominally makes decisions on immigration in, in uh, the United Kingdom, as being character, characterized as untrustworthy, no matter how often its evidence is brought into question. Deception has also long constituted one of the main grounds for expelling a person. And one could go on and multiply examples. I'm sure there are examples from criminal law, etc., etc. 
Um, conversely, in practice, lying is also frequent in the immigration context, and uh, the presentation of many types of documents from South Asian countries, which are produced to fulfill the increasingly preposterous evidential requirements. Expert witnesses are often brought in to help in assessing whether such documents or the accounts given are plausible. One observation I found very interesting uh, is that both sorts of notions, i.e. the factual and the moral stroke ethical of truth and falsity, actually exist in both cult cultures. Balu's paper makes this clear. Yeah, they are both there. However, because of the dominance of one way of understanding their significance in the West, the moral dimension tends to drive the factual sort of statements. I wonder if this is a problem beyond, uh, beyond the specific domain Balu asks us to focus on and affects a much wider range of circumstances. I've been asked to stop very soon. Um, I can come back again. Yeah, yes, 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 okay. Uh, I, I, will, I will come back. Uh, may, maybe just to tie it up, yeah, Balu's discussion of tr uh, uh, truth and falsity makes clear that lawyers, uh, as well as perhaps other social scientists, have to do much more work to excavate the religious background of the ideas that infuse law, both in the West and in a country like India today. We are also duped into considering that secularization of any particular legal idea necessarily achieves its generality and context-free application. This is, of course, not so, as Balu notes for Indians in particular. How can Indians who are not legal prof professionals even grasp the religious root of core legal ideas? So they must apply other common sense notions. However, we as legal and social scientists are also not that certain how far the specifically religious dimension of any idea that was religious and has since acquired a secular garb comes to be still tied to religion, right? And, and the point made about the secular friends perhaps being insulted at, at, at the suggestion that they're actually deploying religious ideas when talking about truth and falsity is quite interesting. Um, this is something that is difficult for many to understand and I have to admit that I can always get it across adequately myself. Thanks. Sorry Thank to, to go on beyond time. No, no that's fine. Uh, are there any uh, comments to this point? Then we'll turn to Vernon okay. Manzi. Yeah. Um, I still struggle with uh, your basic categories or our basic categories of law and religion and in, in relation to truth and falsity. Because if we talk about truth for Indian law and religions, yeah? Uh, we are probably talking about an inability to agree or an agreement to disagree very early on because I, I think, I may be wrong, uh, I, I think that Indian religious traditions and consequently also legal traditions are built on an understanding that absolute truth is not knowable if you like, certainty is something that you can, if you like, try to achieve, but you can always be challenged. And this parallels very interestingly, of course, the Islamic concept of ikhtilaf. Nobody ever can fully understand what God meant. So every person, every human who dares to speak about any aspect of Islamic law is a little bit wrong because nobody can fully understand what God meant. And I think Hindus share that because many more years ago than your three and a half decades uh, of work, they disagreed over this very basic truth. And out come those bits of evidence that we see of one person saying this in one moment and one person saying that in another moment. Because when the British came to India, they asked, I mean, imagine the language problem. They asked people here, the pundits, the Mulvies, what is the law? What is your law? But the pundit was answering in terms of dharma, not in terms of law. And the dharma of every situation was different. So of course our big British colonial administrators got annoyed. And they went to one pundit and he said one thing. And he went to another expert and this expert says another thing. I'm not surprised. But is that deception? Or is that a reflection of the fact that truth is relative? 
that life is plural. And maybe I should have disclosed from the beginning, I think I talk a lot about legal pluralism, cultural pluralism, as a comparative lawyer. So I think we need to be more aware of these pluralities and the scope for disagreement, rather than searching for agreement and certainty. I mean, Robert, you raised the point of difference. I think we all agree that all cultures are different, and yet we all have cultures, and yet we all have religions, we all have laws, but they're different everywhere. So what is true? What is false? That's relative, maybe. I leave it there. Thank you. In a way, I feel sorry that I did not quite communicate my ideas properly. Partly it has to do with the difficulty of the, of the subject matter, partly it, it, to do with the brevity of the paper. But there are many things I did not say, I could not possibly say as a philosopher. I just mentioned them. For example, I didn't speak anything about truth-telling. Truth-telling is different from the notion of truth. So I'm not talking about truth-telling at all. I can also say, satyam vada dharmam chara, <laughs> you tell the truth. So it's not unknown to us. I did not say that Indians do not know, make a strict distinction between truth and falsity. Of course they do. I didn't even suggest it, so, but probably my paper is implying that I should like to reread it again with Robert's eyes. A uh, second for point, for example, I certainly do not intend to make. I have never made it. In fact, I, 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 I combat it. Is this idea of incommensurability of cultures. First of all, it is philosophically very, very incoherent. Because incommensurability is a word that comes from geometry which philosophers of science used in a very, very precise sense when they spoke about incommensurability of theories in a scientific revolution. So it really doesn't make very much sense to talk about incommensurability of cultures. Let me exaggerate it a little bit this way. I think we share probably 99% of things in common as humanity. We differ perhaps at 1% or half a percent and that's the most interesting thing and that is what I am talking about cultural differences. So I do not anyway ever want to suggest, even in a mild understanding of the word, there is something called incommensurability of cultures. For the simple reason, if I thought that, why would you have an international conference? I mean, how can I possibly write a paper to Robert and ask him to understand and talk, comment on it if I believe in incommensurability of cultures? On the contrary, I think it's possible for us to communicate perfectly well. My confusion, if there is a confusion, uh, yeah, Robert misunderstands me, he misunderstands another American, uh, another American equally or even more. So nothing to do with me being an Indian or because I have an Indian culture. But I'm sorry I'm conveying that. So like this, there are a couple of uh, uh, things, but perhaps I'll say one thing and stop. Let me tell you how I came to this problem and why I have been thinking about it very, very deeply for the last one year. See, I live in Belgium, as you know, and I speak Dutch. In Dutch, there's a word called betrouwbaarheid. I won't translate it, because that is, the, that is the beauty of it. I understood it. I know language, I've been living there 38 years. I had understood as reliable, meaning predictable. That's how I had understood the word, betrouwbaarheid. So, science, for example, they would call betrouwbaar. So it's reliable, it's predictable, it tells you the truth. And my children used to speak in a very funny Dutch, which used to irritate the hell out of me because I'm a philosopher by nature. I'll give you one example. At three years old, at three, when my second son was three or four years old, he was playing on a computer, he was playing a chess game on the computer, and my children would say such things as, uh, the computer is not eerlijk, the computer is not honest. I used to get very pissed off. I said, computer can neither be honest nor dishonest. It has to do with sentences, you know. It has to do with truth and falsity of sentence. How can the computer be dishonest? So I tried to teach them, philosophically we were speaking, but they kept on relapsing to this language. And then in my university, some, many people used to tell me that I was un unbetrowbar. So I translated as unreliable. 
And I said, what the hell are you guys talking about? I'm the most reliable, most predictable guy who lives. So why do you say I'm unreliable? About a year ago, so 38 years of living in Belgium, knowing Dutch, living with Dutch women, uh, women, women, <laughs> I mean, I, I, of course, I, I also live with Dutch women, but not in the sense I live with my wife, of course. Yeah. Dutch women and men, yeah. okay, that's better, living with the Dutch women and men. Uh, I discovered a year ago, unbetrouwbaar, or betrouwbaarheid means trustworthy or deceitful. So when they said Balu was unbetrouwbaar, they, mean, they meant not that Balu was not reliable, but that Balu was a deceiver. I never realized it. I had a shock of my life. 38 years I didn't realize. So when my children said, the computer is dishonest, they were saying the computer is not trustworthy. I didn't understand it. Then I started going around India asking questions in different languages. I said, what, what? So they came up with, what is falsity? Jute. Jute, jute means what? Ho, it's a mistake. It is error. And there's a difference between jute and dhoka, for example, in, in Hindi. Sullu and mosa in Kannada. Sulli heli mosa marda is different from sulli herda. That is how we talk. So I began to realize that it's a very deep problem here. It's not about truth-telling, that is, that is a verbal act. And that's how Aristotle defines it. In terms of truth-telling, Aristotle never defined the notion of truth. So in that sense, it's very wrong to say there's something called the Aristotelian notion of truth. Truth-telling is different from what truth is. Now, what is truth and what is falsity? I don't say Indians don't make a distinction, they make a very sharp distinction. Like any other culture does. But the point is that the, con the core components of these meanings, where falsity is tied to <coughs> deceit, almost inseparably, almost is important, but inseparably is equally important. That is not the case in about 10 to 15 Indian languages with whom I have spoken to people. I want to make a sociological analysis of it. Then I discovered articles about Chinese child rearing, where they also do the same thing that we Indians do. We teach children systematically to tell lies. Saura sulheli madhemado. That is how we speak. Tell 1,000 lies and get, get your daughter married. So because that is because the, the notion of lies or falsehood doesn't carry the notion of deceit, deceit with us. Whereas in Europe, if you are lying, normally the notion of deceit and untrustworthiness is, 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 is baked into it. I will stop. Uh, so, the origin was that the shocking discovery that I did not know what Bhadrabhar had, what Var had, what false had, and I'm using Dutch words, meant, and the last one year of struggling with it. I agree, my, my, my colleagues don't see uh, that sharp a difference, they're skeptical. Well, they have to be. They are Western, are they not? I'd be very, very deeply surprised if they had access to what I was trying to get across. So in that sense, I completely understand the skepticism. So would I have been perhaps even a year ago. But I submit the problem exists. Thank you. Now, I'm going to try to focus us a little bit. I've suggest, I suggest three questions, but you don't have to follow them. Just to focus the discussion a little more. First of all, is there a difference between Indian culture and something that you're all calling Western culture, which I wonder about myself because it's such a generalization. Is there a difference in relation to truth and falsehood as implied in Balov's paper? That's one question. The second one is, does this difference, if it does exist, affect law in both cultures? And the third question, is this difference, if it exists, an example that could lead us to a future research program. So with those three questions, the first one perhaps is, do you agree with Balu's paper? Do you agree that there is a difference between truth and falsehood in Indian culture as opposed to Western culture? Just a quick poll, go ahead. May I say something? Uh, I, I think I, do, I, do, I really don't have problems with this argument that uh, 
There is a difference. Th- th- there is a disti- distinct sensibility among Indians there is a as difference. opposed to Western. That, that's fine. I think Indian culture the, is more deceptive, you're saying. Uh, no. You, you <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, I've, no done, I've not done research to, okay. to, to answer that question. Okay. Um, but I, th- I think the, the, the move, moving a step further, the more interesting question which is raised by Balu, even if we just restrict ourselves to the question of truth and falsity, is... Uh, and you raise this as well, um, what happens to such constructs when they are applied within legal contexts in, uh, in a cultural environment uh, which is unfamiliar, right? We, which is different to the ones from, from which they came, and particularly one, uh, what one, the concepts which are reared and developed within a culture which was inf- influenced by Christianity and, and bears that heavy stamp. Um, so in other words, what, what do Indians do with those legal concepts? I think that w- that's the really productive line of inquiry that Balu's paper suggests. Um, I see it as a case study that one, one could actually have lots and lots of different concepts and study them and see what Indians are doing, the imported concept concepts and study them. One, one, one other thing, question I want to pose is why or, or, or what would be the difference among the different types of legal transplants that make their way into India? So for instance, um, do Indians understand train in a different way to, or, or railway? They, I'm sure there must be legislation to do with railways, right? The Indian Railways Act or something like that. Um, do, do Indians see legislation or laws like that differently? Do, do they, is there intelligibility? Because uh, they've been transposed. Because no, they've no, been no, 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 Bec- because uh, uh, to my mind at least, I haven't done research on it, but I would suggest that the idea of train is not so tied to Christian theology as the idea of truth is, or falsity. And so the transplantation of certain types of concepts may, may have little disruptive effect or distortion um, in a different cultural environment, whereas some others, and I think the Balu's paper suggests that those c- constructs which are developed within a religious culture and bear that heavy religious stamp do something different in a different culture. And, and, and that's the thing we have to really pursue. Yeah. That's a fairly clear statement. Thank you, Prakash. I would say uh, yes, yes, and, and expand on those two and then try to say a little bit about the third. Um, I, th- I think there is a difference. I don't, I, again, I want to move away from this distinction between truth and falsehood because I, I think what we're really talking about is something broader, which is a certain conception of how language works. And I do think that that is different between this normative conception we have in the modern West with this absolute emphasis on the university of language and emphasis on semantic function. You know, this has been pointed out by many people like Bernard Cohn in the past. And I, you know, I'm on the record connecting uh, monotheism with the idea of a univocal language. You know, the notion that, that language has to uh, attach uh, a singular um, meaning to the sign uh, is also connected with the idea that, that the name of God has to be rectified or justified. So I'll just refer to chapter three in the language of disenchantment, which just came out in September. Uh, there's, there's a whole discussion of this, um, how the colonial project of people like Max Mueller to create a, a kind of uh, missionary alphabet as well as a universal language, which went back to earlier Baconian projects in the 17th century, was absolutely uh, informed by monotheistic principles. The idea of linguistic images can be false or true was connected with iconoclasm. That was also true for Bentham. And so that's a segue to saying that, yes, it influenced law. Because, and I've, again, I've already published on this, so I'm just repeating what I've said in the past. Um, Bentham's idea that language, especially within the language of the law and the legal code, uh, has to be univocal in the same way that the Bible, text of the Bible has to be established and that false idols have to be purged from language. Um, that's, that's something that has massively affected in its broader outlines. Uh, the movement of law in the modern period toward um, standardization, codification, un- uniformization. It's, but it's about semanticization. It's about this, this insistence on transparency, without which, of course, you can't have a notion of truth because there's always ambiguity. Um, so it's a, de- it's a question of degree, but I do think that there's a demonstrable centuries-long history of drive toward that 
rendering of language as uniform, which does have roots in monotheism, as Balo suggests. So I agree with that strong point that he makes. By the way, if that's the case, then I suppose we'd also have to connect the, the opposite tendency with, with polytheism, uh, perhaps. But maybe that's something he would like to address. And as far as the research program goes, I don't think it's anything other than an ordinary research program of doing good cultural history of ideas, which is to understand the fact that all of our institutions, including our legal codes, our legal systems, are embedded in larger cultural networks that include religion. If we don't, if we have lawyers who don't read, I've been saying this for years, if you have lawyers who don't read religious texts, uh, <laughs> even, even when, you know, in the 19th century, you can't understand much of what colonial British were saying in India without knowing the language of the King James Bible or the Geneva Bible, for example. If you think you can go about it in that way, then you're mistaken. Uh, and so we need that kind of broad scale cultural history, which, which I think actually can tend to support the kinds of arguments that Bolo is making. Uh, sometimes he makes them in a way that's, you know, not, not the way that I would say it because it's a disciplinary distinction. He's a philosopher, a historian of ideas. But I, I think that's, for me, that's the program. The proof is in the pudding. It has to be in the cultural history. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen. Well, a, a um, couple of observations in response to these uh, questions and also the remark. Uh, is there a difference between Indian and Western culture with respect to to truth and falsity and uh, the virtues of truth? Uh, I suppose or I'm not quite sure how to put it. Um, on the, uh, I have no basis at all, uh, having been in the country for three days now, I think, to to say much about the Indian side of this, um, but. Um, I think that the claim is that there's a difference still be, because of uh, uh, an important distinction in Indian languages and culture between deception and lying. Uh, I, I still remain somewhat uncertain as to, uh, as to that uh, distinction and why that would work out in the way that, that it does. Um, Robert says, however, that um, th there might be a difference, be not so much about truth telling, but about just the meaning of language. And he could be right about that, that, that there's more of a, emphasis in the West on uh, unitary meanings uh, to language. If, if that's true though, I would associate that more with science and philosophy than with Christianity, I think. No doubt there is that theme in Christianity at times, but there's also, I think, a very strong theme in Christianity with Augustine and others about how scriptures can have you know, any number of different meanings. They can have literal meanings and they can have allegorical meanings and moral meanings and, and so forth. So, so there's a lot of emphasis, I think, in the Christian past uh, on language being able to be, have lots of levels of meaning and be interpreted in different ways. Um, and even today, I would say, um, among people I know, it's, uh, I think, scientists and philosophers who are most impatient uh, uh, with, you know, with language being ambiguous and having different meanings and so forth and are most insistent on trying to fix the, the meaning of language. So th there might still be a difference. Uh, if there is, I'm not sure that, uh, that I would attribute it to the Christian past. Um, Finally, just uh, to reiterate one point, uh, I can readily imagine, I don't know if this is true in further research, uh, I suppose, or, or people, knowledgeable people could, could clarify this, but um, that if there's a difference in Western and Indian attitudes towards lying in certain contexts, it might not reflect general cultural differences, but just again, different histories in which, it's, if we're talking about witnesses in court, which is a subject that comes up quite a lot in uh, Bala's paper, one can readily imagine that that might be, you know, a certain kind of judicial proceeding might be seen as a sort of an imposed um, foreign institution. And I, I think in many situations in the West and probably elsewhere, people often do have a sense that in that context, um, lying is not necessarily bad. Again, you know, there's, a, uh, there's no right to, to, to the truth. I mean, this, this comes up in different contexts, and there's a Jesuitical tradition for which the Jesuits were reviled, I think, in, in the West, you know, as Jesuitical almost meant rationalizing, coming close to uh, something that approaches lying. But I think, again, it developed in terms of contexts in which the, um, 
they regarded themselves as being forced to answer questions and so forth that, uh, that they shouldn't have to answer. And so it was, it was permissible to work out mental reservations and different techniques for, for telling lies, but that was appropriate. It's, so given the different histories in India and you know, some judicial systems in the West, it might well be that there would be different expectations of witnesses, you know, different, different habits of witnesses, and that um, there, there'd be some sort of cultural understanding that witnesses in court may lie and not feel any sort of shame about it. But that wouldn't necessarily reflect any general difference between the West and uh, Asian or Indian traditions about the value of telling the truth or the, uh, or the wrongfulness of, of telling lies in, in general. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone? Nomi, I thought yeah. your three questions were brilliant. Uh, and oh, the thank you. I knew I liked first, you, Werner. And the first, <laughs> and the first one, uh, y you seem to have understood me to mean something like incommensurable. That's not... No, no, not, no. No, no, no. Not you. Yeah? You. But, no, yeah, okay. But, uh, you know, we shouldn't see it like that. It's simply different. And differences are everywhere. Yeah? Uh, and clearly these differences have an impact on law, to answer the, first, the second question. But the third question I would see differently because I work on modern Indian law also. And I think the research project that you are moving into without maybe without fully realizing it is actually how do we see the role of the modern Indian state in the management of all these differences? Because there are so many different Indians, there are so many different convictions, there are so many different concepts of truth and falsity and what have you, and ambitions and aims and development concepts and what have you. And so the real struggle that I think ultimately a place like India, but really every country is facing, is the balance between state involvement, more state involvement, and less state involvement. And India, um, Again, many of you might disagree with me, but India is strong because of its awareness that limited state involvement is better. And your constitution says this in so many ways. Look at your directive principles of state policy, okay? A promise for the future. We will aim to do whatever. And what does it say in Article 38, for example? Yeah? The state shall try to achieve certain conditions as effectively as it may. Please. Yeah? Okay, we can try. We'll never get there. Yeah? There is no certainty that everyone will have a job, everyone will have a good life, there will be justice, and so on and so on. So we are dealing here with a justice system that is very different from the kinds of promises made in Western jurisdictions. And I think we need to be aware of this for any type of project that you want to construct here in terms of comparative law. Asian and African legal systems are not working along the lines of Western legal systems, very clearly. They might aim to get there, but they will never do it. And India knows what we are doing wrong in the West. The Eurozone is in crisis. Somebody said it in the morning already. So do you see religion as a site or religions as a site for law that would be different or possible, a possible different site within a state for different laws, a containment of difference? Okay. Uh, I don't think any state can avoid religion. Uh, we have to know what it is first. No. It's no? there. It's there. You have to live with it. And if you define it away, as we've tried in the West, we've tried to say we're secular. We divide law and religion. It didn't work. I think we've realized it. Millions of Pakistanis live in Britain. Hundreds of thousands of Hindus and Sikhs live in Britain. They do what they think is right. Now, we can't control these things. Every state in Europe sees this now. So when we do immigration law, when we have all these types of issues in Europe now, we are running into deep trouble. And India has from 47 onwards and way before known that this pluralism is there and needs to be managed. So religion has always been a part of this. But I don't want to start into in a debate now about secularism and all these kinds of things, okay? But maybe quickly look at the, pa the page that I distributed. Um, inspired in a way by what you are trying to do. I'm trying to suggest here, if one wants to look at 
future legal development anywhere in the world, one has to find the right balance between competing elements of law, because we are not clear about our definitions of law. I still have problems here in this debate with what we mean by law and by religion, because too many of us in this room still believe that law is about state law. That's it. Or maybe today it's about human rights. And the other things are old. Can you see religion hides under natural law? It hides in the corner of society and influences customs. But many of us want to define those things away. And I've told you earlier about partial theorizing. So we're trying to be modern. We're trying to be yeah, uh, transformatively oriented in some form and try and negate the presence of these old types of law. But they're all still there, I'm afraid. And they have to be balanced. And that's the challenge for any project of the kind that you are laying out in, in front of us, I think. And I fully agree with you that there are huge problems and huge challenges before India to handle this. Yeah? But we need the right methodology to tackle the tensions that actually you are showing us are there. Because I don't think we are there in terms of understanding the challenges that a place like India faces, in terms of how to handle religion how to handle communal violence and things like that. It doesn't di follow on directly from Werner's point, but this morning I got uh, a, a free copy of a newspaper in my hotel room. So I picked it up and brought it to Bangalore. Bangalore. Uh, and you know, it's inter you know these uh, two ladies who were arrested recently for sending a, a Facebook message? Uh, you know, they were protesting against the uh, sh uh, shutdown. Yeah, we, we are, I think you guys know the story better than me. Um, but uh, when the police were uh, using the law, basically they used the Information Technology Act in India. Now, it's interesting that the newspaper reveals that basically that law has been cut-pasted from an English law, which is called Malicious Telecommunications Act of whatever it is, right? Wh whatever, yeah. Uh, and this was brought in uh, to Indian law in 2008. Um, so, I mean, the, the kind of issue that Bolu is trying to introduce, I mean, he's, he's talking about the historic, the colonial transplantation of different legal concepts involving truth and falsity and so on. It's, this is a process which is continuing. Yeah? It seems like, I, I hear what Werner you're saying, yeah? that India is in a way engaged in trying to chart its own path. Um, but far too often, I think there's a blind cut pasting of laws you know, because, from England or from the United States just because we think, Okay, you know, they, they are the best, so we must have one of, you know, the, the same thing for ourselves as well. Um, and now a lot of people end up complaining about the abuse of this law by not only the magistrate, but even, the, uh, not only the police, but even the magistrate, who, who apparently sort of sanctioned the, uh, the, uh, the keeping in custody of these ladies, mm -hmm. right? I, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know about yeah, the... No, lady. sorry. Yeah. I, I, mean, I'm a, I'm a, I think people generally may, may have seen this news story, yeah? but do look at, it, look at the newspapers. It's a quite an interesting application of a transplanted law, which somehow doesn't make sense to people. right? And now all of a sudden, you know, it was just put, brought in in 2008, and people are already to talking about reforming it. Right? So these things are not thought through in the way Balu asks us to do. Right? So let's consider, does this type of thing make sense within the kind of legal consciousness that Indian people in general or a particular section of Indian people actually share, right? Does it make sense? Is it intelligible, right? And this is the core problem here, right? Um, alongside it, there are other problems. How do Indians sort of distort things, use things in a strategic way, all kinds, of, they, you know, it, it's not just misapplication or manhandling or whatever, right? There's all kinds of different reactions, but we need to study these closely from a socio-legal perspective. Otherwise, we don't really know what the law is doing in real life, yeah? It just looks good on the statute book, and we pretend that we've solved the situation, but actually, real life is more, more complicated, so it's almost, I think Balu nudges, nudges us in a direction to do more legal anthropology, right? How do people use law? How do they react to law? Right? Uh, and not just ordinary people, also the officials who are asked to enforce these laws and so on. Um, so that's the massive research program that you have ahead of you. I, we c I can sit comfortably in London and, and relax, right? Uh, and I can do my own stuff, but you, it's you guys who have this huge challenge, right? To consider these kinds of issues, to consider the kinds of, kinds of things that Werner is talking about in terms of, you know, how do you read the Indian constitution in an Indian way, right? Is it even possible, right? I'm sure it's possible, right? Uh, and 
to what level are distortions involved in, in, in the process of doing so, etc. The, the quite list of the research agenda here is huge, right? Uh, so this is just an illustration. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, on a, <clears throat> on a different issue, but going back to what I what I think was was the theme of, of truth and, and falsity. You know, I want to I want to say something else, and in this in these remarks, I think perhaps I'm anticipating some of the themes that we're going to address in subsequent days, uh, perhaps tomorrow when we talk about procedures of adjudication and, and what legal, legal process is supposed to do uh, and how legal process itself has been transformed uh, in the West and what the consequences of that are. But, but going back to truth and falsehood, I wanted to question, interrogate the proposition that uh, legal procedure or, or law is designed to produce the truth because it seems to me that's kind of a framing assumption um, that would make this uh, initial proposition more relevant to law, even though it's at least uh, nominally uh, about, about language. Um, law, it seems to me, is not really necessarily designed to get at truth. Law is designed, I would argue, to produce certainty. And so the procedures and rules of law uh, are primarily designed to achieve that end. In fact, there has to be closure. And we're not really talking about truth and falsity, we're talking about um, one party is vindicated and, and the other's claim fails, right? There, there is or is not a pun. Now, I realize there are shades of gray and there are lesser included offenses and damages can be reduced, but the bottom line is that, that law does produce an either or result. This is true in every culture. So in that respect, at least, there would be, we would assume, no difference between Indian and Christian European cultures. Uh, in fact, no culture, getting back to the question everybody know, actually has to natively know the distinction between truth and falsehood, otherwise we couldn't function and so forth, and the fact that time is linear and that words mean what they say. Um, in the same way, law always and ever has to be designed to produce a result. Um, and the same is true by trials by ordeal, uh, right? Which often, you know, as in some of the rules in the Divya Tattva, the drawing by lots, for example, that you pick the figure of either dharma or adharma. So the, the, the white figure or the, or the dark figure, um, and it's, it's the quintessential form of drawing by lots, like drawing straws, and if you get adharma, it's the short straw. And what does that do except to produce a result where formerly there was absolute uncertainty, now there's certitude. So it's not really truth per se. I mean, I think this is an issue that's closely connected to truth, but I would just dispute the very idea that, that really, I mean, because you know, I, I, I did practice law, however, briefly, and it didn't seem to me that it was really much about truth at all. And of course, one of the things you learn in law school is to ar how to argue both sides of the question or out of both sides of your mouth. And I, I imagine that's probably true also in India now, but I'm so far away from uh, law practice that I, I won't speculate also about others' experiences. So, so it, it seems to me in, that that's a way of also interrogating um, this proposition that law is really about you know, truth versus falsehood. I understand there are issues like perjury and false witness and evidence is good or bad or not, but there's always some kind of procedure. Now, it's also the case that the procedure, I think, has gotten much more rigid and bureaucratic in modern times, and that's for a whole variety of reasons that we need not get into here. Um, but be, because, of, because of that seems to me to be the basic function of law, I just, I, I'm also a little bit quizzical about, about this, this notion that truth and falsity is somehow the, the, the proper point of embarkation for this discussion. Thank you. Did you want to? Well, I don't think uh, law is about certainty. Uh, certainly the English experience at the moment is, is much more about maintaining uncertainty and creating uncertainties. And you see this in many places. But law is also about power and the possibility of exploiting uh, privileged positions yeah? and presumptions of equality that in real life don't hold up. So I think we must not forget those kinds of problems when we address what we are addressing here. How about this for a, a closing thought, or, and maybe some of the uh, panelists would want to talk about this. Balu says in his position paper, 
uh, and I think it's quite interesting and quite provocative. Instead of promoting a cohesive society, institutions of Western laws in India encourage divisiveness and conflict in society. Comments on that? There's just one short comment I want to make. See, I am not so sure that getting trapped into, or going, not so much getting trapped, discussing about law, that is either at the level of philosophy of law or at the level of general jurisprudence, where you ask questions about law is, what its function is, what its goal is, and so on, is so much very productive for the kind of questions I'm raising. I'm not raising questions about law, I'm raising questions in law. I am doing, if you like, to put it in, a, in the terms of a lawyer, something like a um, local jurisprudence. If you like, this is a jurisprudence of certain parts of cr criminal law that I'm doing. So it is there that I'm beginning to find problems, which at a meta-theoretical level are not a, do not come up as problems at all, or may not come up as problems at all. So I'd very much allow that we don't go to a meta-theoretical or philosophical or general jurisprudential terms because I think we'll miss the questions. Thank you. Stephen? Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, what, what is the timing now? We, we're, we're moving toward T. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, this would just be a concrete instance that would touch on some of the comments that have been made. I, I was, I've been listening to the different comments that have been made and thinking about uh, a concrete setting where they would come up. It seems to me that um, maybe, the, maybe the clearest concrete setting is a situation where uh, it's a criminal prosecution where the um, police are convinced that they've found the, the defendant, you know, that they have the guy, you know, they, they've got the right guy. They may have lots of incriminating evidence that, for various reasons, is not admissible in court. Um, so I think it's true, uh, as Robert said, that producing truth is certainly not the sole goal of, you know, of, of criminal law. And now, I mean, truth with respect to the guilt or innocence of a particular person, that's not the sole goal. And we might exclude a lot of evidence that would, uh, for, for various reasons, that we think would actually might be valuable in figuring out whether the person is really guilty or not. Um, but uh, because we have other goals in mind, I mean, we have other values at least in, in mind as well. On the other hand, truth is certainly an important goal. And uh, I think uh, in the West, and I suspect here, uh, there'd be sort of a, a real aversion to convicting someone who's innocent. Um, Although there may be situations in which authorities have reasons to want to do that, but in general, there'd be a real aversion to doing that. So, so the concrete question sometimes I think that arises, uh, and I'm sure it would be true for law enforcement officials anywhere, is something like this. Um, suppose we, we know that we've got the guy, we know he's guilty. We, so some of the really damning evidence has been ruled inadmissible. And so there's a risk that the, the case is going to re result in you know, a, a fault, an erroneous verdict, and so forth. Um, we can get a witness who will say that, uh, yeah, he saw, he saw this guy do it, and the jury will probably, probably believe it. Um, that will, in one sense, be, he will be lying in one sense. He didn't actually see him. On the other hand, he'll be lying in the interest of achieving a true, a, a true result and something that we know. Now, uh, who knows, but I think there's plenty of reason to think that in the West, police would sometimes or maybe often think that that's permissible to use that kind of a witness. Uh, a lot of what is in uh, uh, Balu's paper, I think, talks about witnesses in the Indian system. And um, I, I, all I could do is ask a question whether the attitudes would be any different uh, in the Indian system than they would be in the West. Um, I suspect that law enforcement officials would sort of have the same temptations in both kinds of systems, but I don't know whether there'd be some sort of general difference in, in their attitudes on that kind of question. But at least it would be one situation which you could think about, uh, you know, some, some of these uh, more abstract points that have been, have been raised. Thank you.